the role of gibberellins play in germination of cereal grains. And in particular, the important part is providing substrates, carbon skeletons, for the growing embryo to grow from the endosperm. So the endosperm is typically um, storage of both carbohydrates in the form of starch and proteins. And so what has to happen is these storage materials need to be broken down so that they can be used by the, by the growing embryo. So the, the supply of enzymes, hydrolytic enzymes, that cause the breakdown of the endosperm come from a layer of cells that surround the endosperm called the allurone. And so what we want to finish off talking about is the role that gibberellins play in stimulating the allurone to produce the hydrolytic enzymes that will break down the endosperm and supply the embryo with the, with the food it needs, basically. And your textbook has a diagram that really summarizes all the things that we were talking about before in terms of the role of the DELA protein as a negative regulator of transcription in GA-dependent gene expression. But it also brings in the idea of the early and late, or primary and secondary genes. So basically, if we look at this pathway, in the absence of GA, the DELA protein is bound to the promoter, the GA-dependent promoters. And so transcription of those genes is inhibited. In the presence of GA, the DELA protein is tagged with ubiquitin and broken down, which frees up this promoter to permit the transcription of, now this would be the early genes, the genes that are being made immediately in response to the addition of gibberellic acid. And what this gene encodes, this GAMYB, the MYB proteins, this is a big family of transcription factors. I can't remember how many of them there are in Arabidopsis, but I believe the number is somewhere, somewhere on the order of 100. They are originally discovered associated with uh, light-dependent genes. But it turns out that my B, the, the MyB proteins play a role in regulating all sorts of different types of transcription. So the GA MyB is the gibberellic acid-dependent MyB transcription factor. So the early gene that is made in response to gibberellic acid is a transcription factor, which then itself has a different set of promoters. This GARE, gibberellic acid response element, is the place where the GA, my B transcription factor binds and turns on the late genes, the secondary genes. And in this case, one of the main secondary genes is alpha amylase, the enzyme that's involved in breaking down the starch in the endosperm. Okay, so the alpha amylase genes are transcribed the messenger RNA is translated on ribosomes that are bound to the ER because remember alpha amylase is going to be exported from the cell. The endosperm, the, the endosperm is sort of this layer of, there's not really any cells left there anymore. The, the um, starch is just sitting out in that storage region. So the alpha amylase is actually being exported from the cell. Okay, so this... Yes? Um, so in this case, the uh, amylase gene would be positively regulated. The amylase gene would be positively regulated by? By GAM, by B. Yeah. So yeah. it does exist in plants. Say that again? So positive regulation exists oh, in plants. Oh, it does. That, that, that um, section in the transcription factor didn't say it was always negative regulation. It just said it was more common to have negative regulation. Sure. Most of the steps, remember, any step in a signal transduction pathway can have either positive or negative regulation. So we saw, when we first started talking about this, we saw examples where the negative regulation, as 
we see here, the negative regulations happening at the end of the signal transduction pathway. When we talk about ethylene on um, Thursday, we'll see the negative regulation in ethylene happens at the very beginning of the signal transduction pathway. The, the receptor itself is a negative regulator. So it can happen anywhere in the signal transduction pathway, but it doesn't mean that's the only thing that happens is negative regulation. Okay? It does happen to be negative regulation at this step, but you're correct, at this step it would be positive regulation. Okay? <coughs> so if you look at the mRNAs for these two GA-dependent transcripts, you see pretty much what you'd expect that the messenger RNA for the GA MyB protein, the transcription factor, comes up very early after the exposure to gibberellic acid. But the alpha amylase genes come up only after a lag of several hours. And that lag of several hours is the time it takes to transcribe and translate the GA MyB gene product to act as a transcription factor that controls the expression of alpha amylase. Okay, so there's really two things that you should be seeing here that are familiar to you. One is the negative regulation <coughs> associated with the DELA protein, and the other is this primary secondary gene where when this happens, the primary gene is almost always, although not exclusively, <coughs> is almost always a transcription factor which then controls the expression of a large number of other genes. Okay? Trace. Um, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. So, so with GID1 being turned on, we counted as um, an early gene because it's the gene can express to its GID1 has to be present before the GA arrives, otherwise it wouldn't be able to respond. Okay, so early wages refers only to starting of transcription. Starting of transcription in response to the signal. That's right. Yep. So we're going to see examples, for example, when we talk about um, ethylene, that the that the, some of the early genes, in the case of ethylene, are ethylene biosynthesis genes. One of the things that distinguishes ethylene from many of the other hormones is that a lot of the ethylene-dependent processes require positive feedback. That is, ethylene turns on the synthesis of more ethylene. So in that case, the primary genes involve some structural proteins that are involved in biosynthesis. But most commonly, when you have this pattern of primary, secondary genes, the primary gene that's expressed is a transcription factor, which then is what controls the expression of the secondary genes. Okay? But the signal transduction pathway, all the components of the signal transduction pathway have to be present in the cell at the time the signal arrives. If, it, if they're not there, there's, no, there's not going to be any response because there's no no functional signal transduction pathway, okay? So the early genes won't include components of the signal transduction pathway unless, for example, they're down-regulating them or something like that. But those genes have to be expressed before the signal arrives, otherwise the signal transduction pathway won't work. Okay? All right. So let's just finish up by... Um, the, the book gives a um, nice description of the role that gibberellic acids play in pollen development. And this is, this is something that is becoming more and more important in plant breeding because one of, the way to, one of the ways to, for example, promote outcrossing is to prevent the formation of pollen in certain plants, right? So if the... Um, if the plant can't produce its own pollen, it can only be fertilized by pollen from another plant. So regulation of pollen development in, in flowers is an important thing from an agricultural perspective as well as understanding it from a biological perspective. So basically what this, 
what this uh, illustration is showing you. In the top panels here, we're looking at a um, construct that takes the promoter for the, my, the GA my B gene. So it takes this promoter, but not from the alurone layers, but from the, the developing anthers. It takes that and puts um, gus behind it. And so we're looking at, in the flower and in the developing anthers, the expression of that transcription factor that's GA dependent. So you can see that there is strong expression of that transcription factor early in the development of the anthers. This next panel down here is showing the response of a gene that's involved in pollen development. Okay, so that we would expect then that to be a late gene rather than an early gene that's turned on by the GAMYB, and we can see exactly that, that the, the blue of the gus showing the expression of that gene shows up later in, in the anther development than the transcription factor that controls it. And this is a um, picture of the development of the anthers in a mutant where the GAMYB transcription factor is a mutation. So we're not seeing any indication of GUS expression there suggesting that the, the GAMYB is the key factor that's involved in controlling GA-dependent transcription of genes. Okay, so that the, the consistent picture that should be coming out of this is that GA turns on the synthesis of the GAMYB transcription factor, and that the expression of that transcription factor is what controls the expression of pollen development um, genes in the anthers. Okay? Okay, so the story that you should be taking away from, from these chapters on the hormones is you can look up the details of what's going on here. What I want you to really do is try to fit these examples into a sort of a common framework that describes how signal transduction can work. Right? So you should be able to analyze different types of mutants. If I tell you that this is a, a negative regulatory element associated with the signal transduction pathway, you should be able to tell me what sorts of mutants you would expect to see in that signal transduction pathway if that protein was mutated. But the, the details of these pathways, well, first of all, we don't have a lot of the details. We have only little bits here and there. And those you should be able to fit into sort of a general picture of what signal transduction looks like for these various hormones. Okay. All right, so let's go on then to talk about cytokinins. And in the comments that I read from you guys this morning, the most common, the most common comment that I got was, gee, cytokinins do a lot of different things. How do I keep them all straight? Well, you don't have to keep them all straight, right? I mean, you, if I ask you a question about comparing different types of cytokinin responses in plants, the details of that are all in the textbook, right? Everything that I want you to know is in the textbook. Therefore, it's unlikely that I'm going to ask you a question that asks you to detail any aspect of cytokinin responses. Rather, I'm going to ask you to compare cytokinin with other things. One of the, one of the things that really starts to come out in the cytokinin chapter is the fact that hormones don't often work on their own. They often work in conjunction with other hormones. So we'll see over the course of today's lecture that auxin and cytokinins play very interesting roles together, some of which are synergistic and some of which are antagonistic. You should be able to compare and contrast what's going on in those two different types of interactions, not from the perspective of all the details but rather from the perspective of that you understand how signal transduction pathways work and what must be going on here to allow that to happen, even though we don't know all the details of what's going on there. Okay, so when we think about cytokinins, 
the most common things that comes to mind of a plant physiologist is the role that they play in cell division. And this is derived from some very interesting observations that were made early on in plant physiology that were really kind of troubling. So for example, um, if you look at plant cells, take any cell from a plant from outside the meristem, typically after embryonic development, those cells no longer divide. Okay, so we have division limited to a relatively small amount of cells. So once a cell is differentiated in a plant, it's done. It doesn't divide anymore, except under certain conditions. So for example, wounding. Wounding responses, basically every cell in the plant has the ability to start dividing again if that cell is adjacent to a wound site. So there's some sort of signaling that's going on in a wound that tells cells that would normally not divide to start dividing again. And because wounds can happen anywhere in the plant, this ability to start growing again um, must be present in all cells. The other thing that we've heard about is the formation of lateral roots. So cells that are in the vascular cylinder of the roots that have reached maturity can start dividing again and form a new meristem. We saw similar sorts of things in formation of root nodules, association of the um, nitrogen fixing bacteria from the soil with the roots. Cells that have stopped dividing in response to signals from the bacteria can start dividing again to produce these new nodule tissues. The same thing happens for formation of lateral meristems in woody plants. So the formation of the vascular cambium and the cork cambium, cells that have stopped dividing in response to certain signals will start dividing again. Probably one of the most obvious um, indications of cell division are crown galls. Here's pictures of crown galls. I mean, you can look at the oak trees out there on Tower Road and you can see crown galls. They can be little things on smaller plants or they can be giant things on trees. Crown gall is probably the closest thing in plants to cancer in animals. It is basically uncontrolled cell division. So whatever it is that normally keeps plant cells, differentiated plant cells, from dividing, when, the, when the, this crown gall forms, those controls are released. So basically we know that in plants, all the differentiated cells have, have basically exited from the cell cycle. They're no longer dividing. Some signals associated with crown gall must bring those plants back or bring those cells back into the cell cycle, get them dividing again. So one of the things we want to think about in the context of this control of cell division in plants is what's going on in crown gall. Okay, a couple other observations that were Ah, uh, sorry, Anna. Yes. No, they're not similar at all. Well, in animals, usually what happens in cancer, one of the main things that happens is loss of regulation of of um, signal transduction pathways that control cell division. So, if you've got a, a, a component of a signal transduction pathway that's normally off, that has to be phosphorylated to turn it on. In animals, a mutation that puts that protein in the always on state could be a thing that causes cancer, okay? We're gonna see that, it's, that what's going on in crown gall is not related to mutations in proteins, but rather changes in expression, changes in synthesis of hormones that control those pathways. Okay, so it's changing the signals. Yeah, Stella. Is crown gall ultimately going to be detrimental to the plant, or can it live like? It's a good question. Yeah. So, would you call um, the the pathogen Agrobacterium that causes crown gall? Is it biotrophic or necrotrophic? It's biotrophic. It's not killing the organism. So basically, we'll see what's going on in crown gall. Is the Agrobacterium has has um, 
manipulated the plant to produce the compounds it needs to grow, but it's not killing the plant. So yeah, these the, these crown galls can grow for you know 50 or 100 years on, on old trees. They don't they don't kill the plant. Do they do they become a sink for the products of photosynthesis and everything else that's going on in the plant? Absolutely. That's going to limit the plant's ability to grow, potentially limit its ability to defend itself, but it doesn't necessarily kill the plant. It's actually relatively infrequent that it kills the plant. So if we, if we look at, um, take plant tissues and try, try and grow them in culture. Okay, so you, you snip a, um, a leaf off of a plant and put it in culture conditions. Give it sucrose, give it mineral nutrients. It doesn't grow. Take the shoot apical meristem, cells that are normally dividing to produce all the above ground part of the plant. Put it in culture. It doesn't grow. But if you take the root apical meristem and put it in culture, those cells will grow indefinitely. So there's something fundamentally different between what's going on in the shoot apical meristem and the root apical meristem in terms of controlling cell division. Cell division occurs naturally in the root apical meristem, but there's something missing in the shoot apical meristem that allows those cells to continue to divide in culture. And one of the things, obviously, that, that people were interested in is auxin. So we know that auxin is involved in cell division. So if you add auxin to the shoot apical meristem, does it grow? And the answer is no. The cells enlarge, but they don't divide. So the key thing that distinguishes all these various characteristics that we've been talking about so far is cell division. Differences in is a cell going to divide or not. And so this started the sort of a search for compounds that could promote cell division, particularly of plant cells, non-root cells in culture. Right? Root cells will continue to divide, so they must be producing in the cells everything they need for them to divide. But non-root cells must be missing something that they need to divide. So the search went out to try and discover what this, these compounds were. Okay, so what sort of things could work to do this? Um, one of the first things that was discovered was the liquid endosperm from coconut. So the milk of coconut. You add that to culture medium and shoot cells would start to grow, would start to divide. Um, another one that was discovered was if you take vascular cambium cells from a woody plant, grind those cells up, take the extract and put it into culture, the cells will divide. So there's something that's present in the vascular cambium that allows the, the cells to divide. The, the most uh, bizarre one, a number of you asked questions about this, was the observation that you could take autoclave sper or, um, what was it, herring sperm, I think. You know, so some plant biologist just happened to have a jar of herring sperm up on the um, shelf, and the graduate student wait, said, wait a minute, don't just use the herring sperm, you better autoclave it first. You know, who knows why this happened? It would be really interesting to see what the decision-making process was. But the observation was that the autoclaved herring sperm, heat-damaged DNA is the key, could promote cell division in culture. And from the autoclaved herring sperm, they discovered that the compound that was promoting cell division was this compound kinetin, which is an adenine derivative. Adenine, so like the thing that's in ATP. So... The search went out to find naturally occurring compounds like this, and the first ones were um, isolated from corn uh, kernels, and the compound was called zeatin. So you can see that these have this adenine ring, and now they've got attached onto this rather than a sugar, they've got attached to it an isopentanyl group. So remember, isopentanyl pyrophosphate is the five carbon precursor of all the terpenoids. So an isopentene group has been 
attached onto this adenine, and it is this molecule, which is the basic structural element for cytokinin activities. So unlike gibberellins that were classified as a group based on structure, cytokinins are based on activity. And the two main types of activity that people look for to call something a cytokinin is the ability to promote cell division in culture and obviously to test this you don't use root cells you use shoot cells so the ability to promote cell division in culture is a bioassay for cytokinins and the other one is that we'll talk about later on in the in the um, the lecture is control of the auxin cytokinin ratio and how that plays a role in root versus shoot differentiation. So variations in the auxin cytokinin ratio are also used as bioassays. The ability to change this ratio and make shoots or roots out of um, undifferentiated cells is another sort of these are the bioassays for cytokinin activity. So again, they're defined by their ability to, to promote specific processes rather than by their chemical structure. Okay, one of the, one of the things that um, complicated the initial uh, discovery and understanding of how cytokinins work was the observation that zeatins occur naturally in all different types of transfer RNAs. So if you isolate transfer RNAs from a plant, from an, act, from an animal, from bacteria, you find that some of the adenines, some of the A's in that nucleotide sequence have this isopentanyl modification on it. And so this suggested to people that the source of cytokinins is the breakdown of certain transfer RNAs. This turns out not to be the case. The presence of zeatins in transfer RNAs of all organisms has nothing to do with their activity as cytokinins, as, as cytokinins in plants. Separate biosynthetic pathway, the function that these compounds, that the, these modified adenines have in transfer RNAs is not well understood. But it is understood that it has nothing to do with cytokinin function in plants. The synthesis of cytokinins has nothing to do with the um, transfer RNAs. So in the transfer RNAs, the transfer RNAs are transcribed, and after it's transcribed, specific adenines are modified. We're going to see that in the biosynthesis of cytokinins, there's no transcription involved. The adenine is modified, and then that adenine is not stuck into any transfer RNAs. Okay, so they're, they're two separate biosynthetic pathways. Okay, so I want to take just a brief diversion here to talk for a minute about crown gall and the organism that causes it. The organism that causes it is a bacteria, bacterium. Agrobacterium tumefaciens. And basically what agrobacterium does is, as I mentioned before, it's basically using the, the plant to give the agrobacterium an environment that allows it to grow very successfully. Okay? And the way it does that is the agrobacterium has in it a plasmid called the TI plasmid. And the TI plasmid is not required 
for free living agrobacterium to grow. You can take the TI plasmid out and they do just fine. What the TI plasmid is used for is when agrobacterium infects a plant, that TI plasmid is transferred into the plant cell and a small section of the TI plasmid called the tDNA is transferred into the nucleus, into the one of the chromosomes uh, of the plant DNA. And where it inserts is totally random. So the insertion site of that tDNA is not under any particular control. It can go in the middle of nowhere or it can go right in the middle of a critical gene. If it goes right in the middle of the critical gene, well then that, that's not going to be a successful infection. But as we found out, most of the DNA is not critical. And if it goes into those not critical places, the, the, the tDNA will do just fine. Okay. The interesting thing is that people discovered relatively early is that you could use antibiotics or you can use mild heat treatment and you can kill the bacteria and the crown gall continues to grow. Okay? So what that is saying is the insertion of this tDNA into the plant genome is all that is required for crown gall growth. Once that tDNA is in there, you can take the bacteria away and the crown gall continues to grow. So whatever changes that are happening in the plant that causes this uncontrolled cell growth is the result of the tDNA insertion, whatever genes are encoded on it. Anna. Is there any way to cure or stop the growing? Uh, if you put something in that inactivated the genes in the tDNA, that would do it. Have they ever tried using the same kind of chemotherapy drugs that they use them? No. Um, could you do that? Yeah, I su suppose you could. So if you interfered with some other elements of... So without giving the whole story away yet, what's going on here is there are genes in the tDNA that are controlling hormonal signals that regulate cell division, right? So if you wanted to control crown gall in one of the red oaks along Tower Road, you potentially could add chemicals that interfere with the signal transduction pathways that respond to those hormones, right? That would, that would stop, presumably could stop the cell division. But depending upon what those things that you added were, if they affected other signal transduction pathways involving cytokinins or auxins, those are going to turn out to be the important ones, then, then it wouldn't just kill the crown gall, but it would affect a lot of other responses in the plant, right? So since the crown gall is biotrophic, doesn't kill the plant, typically horticulturalists, plant biologists don't care. Don't, they don't do anything about it. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the, the growth of the gall, once the tissue has been infected, as long as the plant continues to supply carbon, the growth of the gall continues indefinitely. So it will be there and it will keep growing until the plant dies. And once the plant can no longer supply it with carbon, the, the gall will die as well. Okay? So our goal is to figure out what's going on with the tDNA and how does that link in with this uncontrolled cell division. Because remember, the plant cells by themselves typically wouldn't divide. Okay, so if we look at the content of the, the tDNA, there's two important, three important parts of this. First of all, there are these left and right border regions. These are really interesting from a molecular biology seat, uh, perspective because the left and right borders of the tDNA are all that is required for the random insertion of what's between these two borders into the plant DNA. So if you're a gene jockey, a molecular biologist, this is liquid gold, right? You put whatever genes you want between these borders and they get ex randomly inserted into plants. You've got a plant transformation system that works really nicely. And in fact, this is one of the most commonly used plant transformation systems. You put your, you build your 
TI plasmid and you put whatever genes you want between these borders and if you can get those plasmids into cells by whatever mechanism you want, you can transform them. Okay? Okay. So, what are the genes that are naturally present on the TI plasmid? There are two groups of genes that are there. There are hormone genes. And the hormone genes that are there, there are two, there's um, two genes that are involved in auxin biosynthesis and one gene that's involved in cytokinin biosynthesis. All right, so infection and transfer of the, T, of the tDNA into the plant genome provides the plant genome with unregulated genes that are being made all the time that allow the production of both auxin and cytokinin. That's a pretty important clue that what it is that's needed for continuous cell division is a supply of auxin and cytokinin. So that would suggest then that the root meristems are producing both of these on their own. But the shoot meristem we know produces auxin must not be produced in cytokinin. So the cytokinin has to come from somewhere outside the shoot apical meristem in order for those cells to be able to divide. Okay? So the genes that encoding the hormones, just three of them. There's another set of genes that, en that encode the synthesis of these compounds called opines. There's two types of opines that are made, octopine and nopaline. The important thing is look at all the nitrogens in these guys. Right? Lots of nitrogen in these compounds. These are the nitrogen-containing compounds that the agrobacterium, which remember, in a real crown gall, those are full of agrobacterium growing along with those plant cells. The plant cells are providing the nitrogen in the form of these opines that allow the agrobacterium to grow. Okay, So basically what's happened here is the agrobacterium has transferred DNA into the plant cell that allows those plant cells to do two things. One, grow, divide indefinitely due to the auxin and cytokinins, and to produce nitrogen-containing compounds that the agrobacterium itself requires for growth. Okay? Obviously, the other thing that's going on there is the plant is supplying carbon for all of this, for both the the plant cells to grow and for the agrobacterium to grow. Stella? So could an early stage of a crown gall infection be like nitrogen deficiency? Like the stress of the nitrogen deficiency? Okay, so does the, the question is does the production of these compounds in the crown gall deplete the plant of, of nitrogen that it could use for other things? Certainly it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a big sink for nitrogen. Right? So, if nitrogen is limiting in the environment already, that's going to make life tough for the plant. If nitrogen is plentiful, then it shouldn't be a problem. So each um, blue chunk? Yep. Um, so it has several genes? Yep. It has a gene that is part of the oxygen? No, it has several genes? It has several genes. So it's got, it's got it encodes two genes that are involved in oxygen biosynthesis. Those two genes convert tryptophan into indole acetic acid by the pathway that's encoded in bacteria. And it's got one gene that we'll see is involved in converting AMP, adenosine monophosphate, into uh, cytokinins. Okay? So those three genes are sufficient to basically have uncontrolled production of oxygen cytokinin, which allows the cells to divide. And I can't remember how many genes there are for the opines. There's probably a dozen or so that are involved there that allow those cells then also to produce the nitrogen-containing compounds that the bacteria need to grow. So the bacteria is transferring DNA into the plant cells and basically making the plant cells be little factories to produce the things that the bacteria need to grow. So when they use this for... Uh... 
for making GMO like yeah. GMO okay. resistance. Yep. They only like they only put like the gene of interest and the antibiotic resistance gene. So is that engineered tDNA going to be shorter than the wild type? Yeah. So you might only ask. Two genes. So so you might ask. What's the minimum and maximum number of genes that you could put between those two borders and still have it work? And I don't, I don't know what the minimum is. I, I suspect you could just put two in there and it would work fine. And the maximum has changed over time because they figured out how to make this work better. So I, I, you can put 100 genes in there now and under the right circumstances. So that would cause the CDMH to be longer? Be, right? Cause it to be a lot longer. But it's pretty much dependent upon, I, I, I know nothing about what the characteristics of these left and right border regions are that allow them to insert this DNA into any place in the plant genome. Anybody know how that works? No? Okay, so I mean obviously it works. Whether we understand that or not, I don't know. But this has made this an extremely powerful tool for plant molecular biology because you can then use it I mean, the most common technique that's used now is to take flowers and dip the flowers into uh, um, a solution containing the TI plasmid so that you transform. Let's see, what stage do you do this in? Anybody, anybody know what floral stage you do this dip step? I can't remember what it is. But it's a very effective mechanism for producing transgenic. Yeah. It's like a really complicated mechanism involving like two plasmids to insert it in there? Like Depend, yeah, it depends on what type of uh, transformation you're trying to do. <coughs> you, can, you can do it with just a single plasmid, but there are a number of different techniques that use multiple plasmids. They use two different plasmids, <coughs> two different vectors to get stuff in there. So, are we okay with how? I'm still at the flower part. Yeah. Would they then try to like change the genome of the like pollen or something? Yeah. No, of the of the um, of the seed system. of the embryo or something that's going to lead to the embryo. So it's not changing. They're not. They're not concerned about changing cells in the maternal plant. They're they're interested in changing cells that are going to be in the the the, the derived from the embryo in the seed. So it must be something that's very early uh, after the zygote is formed, right? Because you want to have whatever you transform, whatever cell becomes transformed, you want to have every cell in the in the the organism that grows out of the embryo to be transformed, right? So it's got to be somewhere early in the following, immediately following fertilization. That would be my guess. Okay. So the key thing that comes from the understanding of what's going on in crab ball is this idea that both auxin and cytokinin are required for cell division. And it's somewhat surprising, the, the revision of this chapter in the current textbook has really de-emphasized the common role, the synergistic role that auxin and cytokinins play because all cells that divide require both auxin and cytokinin. So we'll see as we talk a little bit more, the emphasis in this chapter has been more on the antagonistic effects between auxin and cytokinin, for example, in controlling root and shoot development. But that same pair of hormones function synergistically in regulating cell division. So in the meristems, you've got to have both of these for the cells to be able to divide, even though in the meristems you have to have different ratios of these to control root versus shoot development. You said they both are synergistically Yep. So is it like the concentration again? Like when we talk about the boxes, the concentration affects like what these responses are? Yeah, so the differences between like root and shoot, yes. So concentration plays a role in it and also obviously the, the relative concentrations as well, which one there's more of. And we'll, as I said, we'll come back to talk about that in just a couple of minutes. Okay, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on cytokinin biosynthesis 
It's actually a relatively short pathway because basically the plant pathway starts off with ATP and takes this DMAPP, which is uh, the common precursor of, the, of all the terpenoids, takes these and puts the isoprene group onto the adenine, makes one modification, sticks this hydroxyl group on there. And notice that intermediates associated in the, with the synthesis of zeatin, the final product, are ribotides and ribosides. Remember when we talked about, when you learned about um, DNA synthesis, ribotides have got a, a sugar and phosphates on it, and ribosides just have a sugar attached to the base. So since we're starting off with ATP, right, this is a ribotide, you're modifying that, and then there is the sequential loss of these sugars and phosphates to get to the final step. And interestingly, these intermediates are not active. They are basically inactive intermediates in the synthesis. And in many cases, it is these intermediates that are being transported in the plant and not the, the active compound itself. So there are intermediates in the pathway of cytokine and biosynthesis that act like conjugates, that act like inactive molecules that have something else stuck on them. In this case, that something else wasn't stuck on after synthesis, but is present from the original biosynthetic pathway, from the starting materials. Okay? But the result is the same, that with the sugar or sugar phosphate groups attached to the, the adenine group of the, of the zeatin, these are inactive compounds that don't have the effect that the free base zeatin has. Okay? Now, interestingly, the pathway for um, cytokine and biosynthesis that goes on in agrobacterium is a slightly different one. Rather than starting with ATP, it starts with AMP. And notice that it also starts with a precursor that's already got the hydroxyl group on it that's not present in the, in the plant system. And one of the things that I've never seen any information about, but is a question that you should sort of ask yourself right away when you see something like this, remember what's happening in agrobacterium is this enzyme, this I, IPT enzyme, the isopentanyl transferase, for, of bacterial origin is being put into the plant genome. It catalyzes this reaction. The plant enzyme uses this as a substrate. Both of, the, both of them will have ATP and AMP. Those are common in all cells. But where the heck does the plant get this? Is this compound normally present in plants? Because the bacterial enzyme requires this compound and not the isopentanyl group that's present in plants. I don't know what the answer to that is. I've looked for it, but I haven't been able to find any information on it. Clearly, it must work. Because when agrobacterium infects plants, it produces cytokinins that promote cell division. How that happens in terms of the substrates, I don't know. Do you think these were used as a form class of bacterial origin? Could, that Could this compound, oh, because the chloroplasts are bacterial, it's, it's possible. Yeah, I mean, some, it must happen, right? Because it works. I mean, it makes. So the bacterial enzyme makes cytokines that cause the plant cells to grow. But from strictly a biochemical perspective, it's not quite clear where this substrate comes from. Okay. So if the enzymes, the genes to produce the enzyme are present in all plant cells, but the agrobacterium genes are unregulated. Yeah, so that's the key difference, right? So every cell contains the a gene that encodes auxin biosynthesis and uh, um, cytokine biosynthesis. But whether those genes are expressed and whether the enzymes are active is the key thing. The enzymes, these are, so the enzymes involved in auxin and cytokine biosynthesis that are put into the plant by agrobacterium must have constitutive promoters. They're being expressed all the time. The enzymes must, in the form that comes off the, off the ribosome, must be active. 
doesn't require any plant anything to turn them on. Right? So they're just constitutively making cytokinins and auxins, and that's what promotes the cells to continue to divide. Nice trick on the part of the agrobacterium. Okay, another thing that's, that um, is important in the overall picture of what's happening with cytokinins is we need to remember that, that when we talk about the local concentration of cytokinin or any hormone, there are a number of different processes that contribute to it. There's synthesis and degradation. There's conjugation and deconjugation. And there's transport in and transport out. Right? With the auxins, we saw that the most important thing was the transport. With cytokinins, transport is important, but local synthesis and degradation also plays an important role. The enzyme cytokinin oxidase which is involved in the breakdown, the degradation of cytokinin. As you saw when you looked in the various physiological roles that cytokinin plays, cytokinin oxidase plays an important role in regulating the local concentrations of cytokinin. And we'll give a couple of examples of that in just a second. Okay, so one of the things that we do need to pay attention to are where cytokinins are made. So we already have really important information that tells us where cytokinins are made. They must be made in the root apical meristems because in culture, root apical meristems can continue to divide with no addition of hormones. So the root apical meristem must produce its own auxin and its own cytokinin. And it turns out that much of the cytokinin in the plant is coming from the root apical meristem. So in contrast, when we talked about Auxin, we saw a picture where auxin is being produced in the shoot and being transported downward in the plant. Now we're going to see a picture where we have cytokinin being produced in the roots and being transported upward in the plant. And what this provides in the most general sense is any place along the root shoot axis, the auxin cytokinin ratio gives positional information. So you never see lateral roots forming you know, up in the, the branches of a tree. And the reason for that is the auxin cytokinin ratio is wrong. It's the wrong position in the plant for lateral roots to form. Okay, so that's just one example of how the production of cytokinin in the roots and auxin in the shoots can provide positional information in the plant that controls developmental things. Okay, so one of the questions we should ask is how is cytokinin transported? Well, it should be pretty clear that a major root of cytokinin transport if it's being produced in the root apical meristems, is in the xylem. Right? So long distance transport of cytokinins is largely in the xylem. It's not entirely in the xylem because cytokinins are also produced by young leaves, young fruits, things like that. So there is some transport of cytokinins in the phloem as well, but mostly it's transported in the, in the xylem. Okay. So let's think about signal transduction associated with cytokinins. And this should be a familiar picture by now. We've seen this uh, at least once before when we talked about phytochromes. This is the similarity between a bacterial two component system and the sorts of uh, ancestors of that that occur in plants. So there are components of the receptor for cytokinins that have a phosphotransfer within the protein and then transfer to this sort of separate protein and then transfer to some receiver domain that then controls transcriptional activity. So it's not the same as a bacterial two component system, but it has a lot of similarities to it. 
One of the things that's, that immediately when this was studied in um, cytokinin that became clear is that these response regulator proteins, um, they're called uh, ARRs, these ARRs in plants have two different um, conformations or two different types of structures. Both of them have this receiver domain that gets phosphorylated from the signal transduction pathway. But only some of them have the sort of output domain. In this case, it's a transcription factor that binds to the DNA. There are other ARRs that lack the, the binding. And it was not clear at all what the function of those that lack the, the binding domain that controls transcription, what those are. But we'll see what they are in just a minute. So the, the key thing here is the fact that these are show like phytochromes show similarities, evolutionary similarities, to bacterial two-component systems. So if we look at uh, a cytokinin-dependent signal transduction pathway, the characteristics of the pathway is we have the receiver protein and the, the, uh, the receptor protein, and that, is, uh, um, that protein is a plasma membra pro membrane protein for the cytokinins. The presence of cytokinin causes the protein to autophosphorylate, transfer the phosphate within the protein, and then transfer to basically to a phosphate shuttle protein that moves that phosphate from the cytoplasm into the nucleus. And in the nucleus, the primary thing that this, the primary place that this phosphate is transferred early on is to the type B ARRs, those that have the the output domain. The phosphorylation of this protein causes this transcription factor to bind to the DNA and turn on the transcription of cytokinin-dependent genes. Okay. Lot, obviously, lots of different functions of cytokinins, lots of different genes that are turned on. But one of the common genes that's turned on in all the cytokinin responses is the type a ARR protein, the one that lacks the output domain. And it turns out that what this type A ARR, so this would be essentially an early gene, it's turned on immediately by the, by the presence of cytokinin. What this does is feedback inhibits the type B ARRs. It keeps them from binding to the DNA and, and producing more product. So this is a feedback mechanism which limits the cytokinin response. Cytokinin comes in, you turn the whole thing on, you start turning on the synthesis of, of lots of cytokinin-dependent genes, but pretty rapidly after that, the accumulation of this type A ARR without the output domain shuts down the continued phosphorylation of the of the type B ARR and transcription slows down. So what this tells you is even in the continued presence of cytokinin in this sort of signal transduction pathway, the response to the cytokinin would be relatively short-lived on the order of a couple of hours, right? Because this feedback pathway would, would eventually shut off the cytokinin response. So don't get the idea that this is the only type of signal transduction pathway that happens in response to cytokinins. It's a model that's based on the, you know, five or ten components of this signal transduction pathway that we actually understand. Okay. So in the last few minutes, let's finish up by talking about um, taking our understanding of this signal transduction pathway and applying it to some cytokinin-dependent physiology in plants. So one of the things that we talked about is the role that both auxin and cytokinin play in regulating division in the apical meristems. Okay, so one of the early studies that was done was to look at what happens, an easy way to manipulate cytokinin content in any tissue is to upregulate 
the expression of cytokinin oxidase. Right? So if you turn on cytokinin oxidase, what that's going to do is decrease the amount of cytokinin that's present in any tissue. It's, it's contributing to its breakdown. Okay? So here's the normal shoot apical meristem that's present in Arabidopsis. Here's the shoot apical meristem that's present in the cytokinin oxidase overexpressor. So it should be really clear that one of the roles that cytokinin plays in the shoot apical meristem is to maintain high rates of cell division because there are many fewer dividing cells in the overexpressor, overexpressor of cytokinin oxidase than there is in the wild type meristem. So in the shoots, cytokinin is maintaining the size of the meristem by promoting sufficient amount of cell division. I'll come back to the role of cytokinin in the axillary buds in just a second, but let's skip ahead to think about what happens if you do this same mutation in the roots. And this was probably the most common question that I got from students um, based on the readings. Because in the roots, if you decrease the amount of cytokinin, what happens to the amount of growth of the roots? In the shoots, if you decrease cytokinin, the apical meristem got smaller. It grew more slowly. What happens if you decrease the amount of cytokinin in the roots? Okay, this is, these are the, um, uh, the bright spots on here represent cells that are, that are actively dividing. This is the wild type, and this is the overproducer of cytokinin oxidase. So it's got less cytokinin. So based on looking at these pictures, what's happening when you lower cytokinin in the root, what happens? It grows more, right? You have the opposite response in the roots than you had in the shoots. Take away the cytokinin in the shoots, the meristem is smaller. Take away the cytokinin in the roots, the meristem gets larger. And what was the explanation that the textbook gave for this phenomenon? What's the role that cytokinin plays that is being lost when you take the cytokinin away that results in larger region of cell division, Stella? Yeah, you're almost there. It's pretty close. So the, the key has to do with differentiation. That, cytokin that cytokinin is in the roots, one of the main role it plays is the rate of cell differentiation following cell division. Higher cytokinin, normal cytokinin levels in the root promote differentiation. If the cells differentiate, do they keep dividing? No. So in, in a meristem that's got normal amounts of cytokinin, the cells, because they're differentiating faster, the meristem stays smaller. If you take away the cytokinin, you slow down the rate of differentiation, which means the cells continue to divide more, and you end up with a larger meristem and more growth. Okay? So just like auxin, we're seeing differential effects of cytokinin on growth of the shoot versus the root apical meristem. Okay? So it should be clear that the role that cytokinins and auxins are playing are complicated in terms of not only meristem identity, we'll, we'll get to that in just a minute, but also in terms of what they're actually promoting. Right? So in the concentrations of cytokinin that are normally present in the shoot apical meristem, that's promoting cell division. In the concentrations of cytokinin that are normally present in the root apical meristem, the primary thing it's controlling that determines the size of the meristem is the rate of cell differentiation. Normal cytokinin makes the, the, the cells differentiate more rapidly, so the meristem actually stays smaller and root growth is slower than when you take away the cytokinin by overexpressing cytokinin oxidase. 
Okay. So these are details that you don't need to memorize. You can look them up in the book. But I should be able to ask you questions. Why are these things important? What's the, what's the functional role of the, a comparison between the roles of cytokine and auxin in shoot versus root apical meristems? And how does this give rise to the different characteristics of these meristems? OK, let's go back to the question about apical dominance. So we talked about when we talked about auxins, we said that if you just look at auxin, in the presence of the apical meristem, auxin is being transported um, down the axis of the stem, and that auxin is thought, was thought to inhibit the growth of the axillary bud. When you cut off the shoot apical meristem, that stopped this flow of auxin, and the initial assumption was that that lower auxin was what triggered the growth of the axillary bud. But we found out that this was, indeed wasn't the case. Because what happens in the axillary bud when it starts to grow is the auxin level goes up substantially. So it's not low auxin in the axillary bud that's turning on their growth, but high auxin. So that cannot be a control related to auxin supply from the shoot apical meristem. So remember, where, what's, what group of cells is auxin being transported in in the, in the shoot? Where is, that, where is the auxin being transported from the apical meristem down towards the roots? Yeah, and the parenchyma cells of the vascular bundle, right? So those are the cells that must be responding to the presence or absence of auxin that's coming down from the shoot apical meristem. So in the presence of auxin, what is thought to happen is that that high auxin turns off the enzymes associated with cytokinin biosynthesis and turns on the enzymes associated with cytokinin oxidation. This should mean that in this region, when there's normal auxin flow from the shoot apical meristem, that the cytokinin concentrations in the vicinity of the axillary buds should be low. When you stop that flow of auxin, that inhibition of the um, transcription of genes associated with cytokinin biosynthesis is released, that enzyme is made, and cytokinin can be synthesized, and the transcription associated with cytokinin oxidase is turned off. That creates a locally higher concentration of cytokinins in the region of the axillary bud. Right? So it's got to be the parenchyma cells adjacent to the axillary bud that are controlling this response. Take away the auxin, those cells start producing more cytokinin, and the effect of that cytokinin is to activate the axillary bud. Once you activate the axillary bud, it's as if it was now the shoot apical meristem. It produces its own auxin and takes over the role of apical dominance that the top meristem used to have. Okay, so now we have a much more complete picture of what's going on in apical dominance than we did when we just talked about auxin. We know that the result of decapitation of the plant is higher auxin concentrations in these axillary buds. Now we know it's, that it's cytokinin that is being produced locally by the parenchyma cells in the vascular tissue adjacent to the axillary bud. That cytokinin synthesis is being turned on by the loss of the auxin flow from the apical meristem. And that higher cytokinin is what triggers the growth of the axillary bud. So simple experiment. Should you be able to take cytokinins and apply it to axillary buds and induce them to grow? If this hypothesis is correct, yeah, yep, and you can do that. You can apply cytokinins to the axillary buds and they will, they will start to grow. They will start to become active meristems. Okay. Okay. 
An experiment the book talks about that I'm not going to say much about in lecture, but I want you to think about it. it is the basis of the study question for today. This experiment is basically looking at what happens if you put a synthetic cytokinin on a leaf. How does it affect what's going on in the leaf if the leaf is a source or a sink? Okay. And what the context I want you to think about this is this is one of those experiments where you're applying exogenous hormones and you're seeing a response. And I want you to think about whether or not this response makes sense physiologically or not. Okay? So we've seen in the case of activation of the axillary buds, application of cytokinin causes that to happen, exogenous application. And it appears that, that that's what's really happening in C2, that in the absence of auxin coming from the, from the shoot apical meristem, cytokinin synthesis is what activates those buds. So here's one that probably is physiological signif physiologically significant. Is it physiologically significant in this situation? I want you to think about that. That would be, you know, for example, a good um, fodder for an exam question. Okay, let's finish up by thinking about this idea that auction cytokinin ratios give positional information in the plant. And one of the things that um, plant molecular biologists have figured out, if you, if you take, for example, um, the TI plasmid from agrobacterium, put your genes of interest in there and also put a marker gene in there, right? And transform plant tissues. You only want to get, you only want to allow to grow those cells that have been transformed. You don't want non-transformed cells in your plant. Having a mixture of transformed and non-transformed cells makes a real mess. That's why you put that marker um, gene in there. Typically that marker gene is for antibiotic resistance. So you take your cells that have been transformed and you treat them with antibiotic that kills all the non-transformed cells. So when you're done, you have a bunch of cells that have been transformed. Those cells may be callus culture, undifferentiated cells. They may be leaf cells. They could be any cell from the plant. If you want to make some use out of this, you've got to take those cells and make them into a whole new plant. In other words, you have to take those cells and regenerate a whole plant. And one of the roles that this auxin cytokinin ratio has become important in is how do you go about taking non-dividing cells or undifferentiated cells and get them to make shoots and roots. Some cultures will do this very easily. Other cultures are very recalcitrant, recalcitrant to do this. And what has been found is that this is not the, the um, greatest picture, but uh, if we look up here, so uh, NAA is uh, an auxin analog, synthetic auxin analog, and BA is a synthetic cytokinin analog. So along up here we have higher amounts of auxin relative to cytokinin, and down here we have higher amounts of cytokinin relative to auxin. So what you see, for example, if we look right here, here is, is um, callus cells that in this virtually no cytokinin, higher amounts of auxin are producing roots only. If we look down here, here's higher cytokinins and low auxin producing shoots only. So it's suggesting that high cytokinin auxin ratio promotes shoot formation, high auxin cytokinin ratio produces root formation. What's wrong with this picture? High auxin to cytokinin produces roots. Stella? Yeah. Right, so cytokinin is producing the roots and the auxin is being transported down. And it's the opposite for the shoots, right? 
auxins being produced in the shoots and cytokinin is being transported up. What does that tell you about what, is, what are the key factors in determining auxin and cytokinin ratios that control this signaling in the plant? Is it synthesis that's most important in controlling the local concentration, or is it transport? Yeah. Transport, right? It's a, it's a really easy conclusion to draw. So here is a case where transport is playing the primary role in regulating the local concentrations. Because you'd expect, if it was just synthesis, cytokinins would be higher in the roots, and auxins would be higher in the shoots. But this is telling us that can't be the case. Now, the other thing that could be a component of this is if the cytokinins that are produced in the roots are produced as inactive precursors, as the ribotides and ribicides. And surprisingly, I've seen very little data on that. It seems like a very obvious experiment to do, is most of the cytokinin that's being produced in the roots inactive precursors or not. But I haven't seen anything that answers that question. Okay, so this is a really good example of evidence that transport for auxin and cytokinins, at least in terms of root shoot controls, is the primary factor, not synthesis. We'll see on Thursday when we talk about ethylene that local concentrations are almost entirely controlled by synthesis and not by transport. Okay, so there's no rules for this. It varies depending upon the physiological conditions. Okay, see you on Thursday.